All right, in this video, so you'll notice we don't have Shankar on the left-hand side here. Um, this is an excerpt from a, one of the recommended textbooks for the course by Klepner Kulenko. Um, so this video is going to help us understand um, Kepler's laws a little bit, and it'll introduce some notation that will be helpful for the, the rest of the course. Uh, and this is, it's this topic right here, acceleration and polar coordinates. Um, so if you'll remember before we, we talked about um, the position vector in multiple dimensions is some x position as a function of time, i hat, y uh, coordinate as a function of time, j hat, and then maybe the same for the z. And when we took derivatives, we could just take derivatives of each of these pieces separately to get the x component of velocity and the x component of acceleration, for example. Um, in polar coordinates, this is a little trickier. And so ideally, we want an, an expression for acceleration in terms of r and theta. So this is going to be the point of the video. And once we have that, we can uh, answer this question uh, in blue right here. Um, so talking about the gravitational force, so uh, Newton's law of gra uh, gravitation says that the gravitational force is radially inwards, um, well, it's, it's a radial force from, from one mass to another mass. Uh, and so, actually, as a consequence, because of this, there's some conserved quantity for orbits. And it turns out it's this quantity right here. Um, so since the mass is constant, actually, what we're going to derive is that r squared theta dot is constant. Uh, and if we multiply by a constant m, the mass, uh, actually, this quantity is called angular momentum. So this is the first time we're introducing this thing called angular momentum, but really, we're just interested in this combination of, um, of variables. We'll talk more about um, other useful properties of angular momentum uh, in a few weeks. And then <clears throat> armed with this, we can also talk about, uh, we can improve Kepler's second law. So Newton came after Kepler. Uh, Kepler stated the second law just based on some astronomical data. Um, but we're able to, with Newton's laws, F equals MA came after Kepler. Uh, with Newton's laws, we're actually able to derive Kepler's second law. So we'll be able to see that by the end of the video. Okay, um, so what you're used to with the xy plane uh, is that w when you're talking about a particle at some point, it has x and y coordinates. Uh, so we are going to talk about not the x and y coordinates of this point, but the r and theta coordinates. So the r is the distance from the origin to our point. And theta is the angle measured counterclockwise from the x-axis. So from the x-axis, x axis, from the x-axis, uh, going towards the y-axis, uh, measuring that angle. So we can specify any point in this 2D plane with its r and theta coordinates. Um, we're also going to introduce a new coordinate system. Uh, the radially outwards direction, r hat, and the theta hat directions. Okay, so this is a, uh, it's an orthogonal coordinate system. These two things are perpendicular to each other, but it's a coordinate system that is not the constant. The, these, these basis vectors are not constant. They depend on where our point is. If we had another point down here, the r direction would be radially outward. And the theta hat direction is defined in the direction of increasing theta. So for this point right here, the theta would be all the way over here, It'd be like 315 degrees. Uh, and the direction of increasing theta is this direction. So, so we kind of have two options here for the direction perpendicular to r hat. Uh, this would be the theta hat direction. So keep in mind these directions of r hat and theta hat depend on which, po which point we're looking at. Okay. Um, so, so we've introduced four quantities, right? R, theta, uh, R hat, and theta hat. Four different things. Two coordinates and two unit vectors. Okay, we can talk about the position vector as a function of time. So it's, it, it'll be a function of time. I might not write it, write it out all the time. Uh, R as a function of time is... So what we're used to is, uh, you know, what I wrote before, it was x i hat plus y j hat, and x uh, depends on r and theta. r cosine theta i hat, 
in R sine theta j hat. So writing it this way actually kind of mixes up the two coordinate systems because it has, uh, it has R and theta uh, in polar coordinates, but then it uses the Cartesian basis vectors. Um, so we want to re-express R just in terms of R theta, R hat, and theta hat. Okay, so, we're, so we make no reference to the Cartesian coordinate system anymore. So remember, R is pointing from the origin to our point of interest. So this thing right here is our R vector. So the vector from the origin to our point of interest is R vector. And if you think about whether that points in the theta hat or the um, R hat direction, looks like that's totally in the R hat direction, right? Just by the definition of R hat. So it's a vector that has magnitude r and direction r hat. So actually, we can write this vector totally as r times r hat, right? magnitude times direction. OK, so this will be our starting point for our position vector in polar coordinates. Uh, so this is r in terms of theta and phi. And I didn't want to quite write r in terms of theta and phi there, because it, uh, it, it, it Depended a little bit on the, the x-y coordinate system as well. Okay, so, so if we want to find the acceleration, we're going to have to take derivatives with respect to time. So the velocity is going to be the derivative of this thing with respect to time. Um, the r hat vector can change with respect to time. So if this point moves at all in this direction, then r hat will change. If we just move along the radial direction, then r hat won't change. So if this point moves outward, then r hat will remain the same, and theta hat will remain the same. And by the way, there, there's a nice figure right here explaining the difference in the, explaining what the, the uh, basis vectors look like visually. So you can see x is always to the right, no matter what point we're at. But the r hat direction, the radial outward direction, depends on where we're at right here. And then theta hat is perpendicular to that. Um, so, you know, if the point is moving in space, that, that r hat could be changing over time. Uh, so we're going to need, we will need, uh, r, dr hat dt and d theta hat dt. All right. So it turns out that, so even though we're, our, our goal is to get rid of, to not use i hat and j hat, it turns out that they will be useful to help us find these two quantities. So we can, we can find these quantities in terms of r and theta um, using, using the i hat, i hat and j hat. So um, this is what I'd like to introduce right here, the r hat and theta hat in terms of i hat and j hat. Um, so I, I don't think this is too crazy to think about. So, so I'm just redrawing this vector right here. So if this is r hat, it has magnitude 1. So if you think about how much is along the horizontal direction, how much is along the vertical direction, it looks like this is cosine theta and this is sine theta. Right? By adjacent over hypotenuse and equals cosine theta and opposite over hypotenuse is sine theta. The hypotenuse being 1 really makes it easy. Right? So r hat is equal to cosine theta uh, in the i hat direction and sine theta in the j hat direction. And actually, the step from here to here makes a lot of sense with that being true, right? We can factor out an r, uh, so it's r times r hat. Now the theta hat direction is perpendicular to this. So the theta hat direction Note if theta is between 0 and 90 degrees, the, y, the x component of theta hat is negative and the y component is positive. Right, so perhaps it's not too surprising that there's a minus sign on this one uh, and uh, the positive cosine right here. And you can see the dot product between these two vectors is 0. Right, you multiply the i hat pieces together. So in other words, rx times theta x, multiply those together, and then add these two multiplied to, together, and that equals 0. So r hat dot theta hat 
is zero, which is what we would expect because they're perpendicular to each other. Okay, so the reason we did that is that we can take the derivatives of these with respect to time pretty easily because the i hat and the j hat doesn't, um, they don't change over time. So dr hat dt, and this is just something we're going to need. Remember, we're, we're, we want to take this expression and take derivatives. So this will just be something in our pocket that we can use uh, when we do that. So dr hat dt looks like we need to take the derivative of cosine theta with respect to t. That's minus sine theta. But then we need d theta dt. So this thing right here is d theta dt. Uh, and that was the i hat. And then derivative of sine is cosine. And then using the chain rule, that's also times d theta dt in the j hat direction. Now you may have noticed right here that we're using um, notation where the dot above the letter indicates a time derivative. This is really common in mechanics. Uh, the dot, so theta dot is d theta dt, which is the angular speed, you might remember. So, so if you ever see omega, that's the same thing as theta dot. All right, so we're going to replace. So it looks like there's a theta dot common to both of these. So this is theta dot times minus sine theta i hat plus cosine theta j hat. And if we look above, that's exactly theta hat. Okay, so this equals theta dot uh, times theta hat. So dr dt is theta dot theta hat. So we're going to save this one for later. Uh, and then we can do the same thing for d theta dt. Okay, so just starting here and then taking a derivative with respect to time. It looks like, so the same thing is going to happen with the chain rule, and we're going to get a factor of theta dot for both pieces. The derivative of minus sine is minus cosine. The derivative of cosine is minus sine. Uh, and it looks like if we take out a minus sign, this is r hat. Okay, so d theta hat dt is minus uh, r hat theta dot. All right, so we'll save these two pieces for now. We'll need them in the course of uh, taking derivatives of this. Okay, so we're going to start here. Our vector equals our coordinate times our basis vector. <laughs> um, and start taking derivatives. Okay, so r is r times r hat. And the velocity is still the derivative of our position vector with respect to time. Okay, that, that's a coordinate independent statement. That doesn't, doesn't depend on our coordinate system at all. So uh, using the product rule, this is going to be r dot. So remember, dot means derivative with respect to time. So we could take the derivative of the first one times the second piece plus the first piece times the derivative of the second piece. So our velocity vector is r dot r hat and we need, we're going to need our dr hat dt, this thing right here, um, plus r theta dot theta hat. Okay. Okay. So what, what this means is that, um, it, so for example, if, if, if we have circular motion, uh, the radius is constant r is constant, r dot would be zero. So if you look at the case where r dot is zero, you wouldn't have this piece, and you have the velocity is just this. And you might recognize that r times theta dot, or r times omega, is the uh, tangential velocity. So it's like how fast your object is moving along that circular motion. So if you had uniform circular motion, this is the speed of your object is r times omega. So maybe that looks familiar. Uh, but this equation is more general than that. You know, even if an object isn't moving in a circle, this is going to be the velocity expressed in polar coordinates. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, what color do I want to use? Black for acceleration. So acceleration looks like we're going to have a lot of pieces, right? When we take a derivative with respect to time, all of these pieces 
um, depend on time. All right, so we're gonna have to use a few product rules here. Okay, so let's try this. So we have r double dot, that means two derivatives with respect to time, times r hat, plus r dot dr hat dt. So we're done with taking the derivative of this term. So now the product rule for this involves three pieces. So now we have plus r dot theta dot theta hat, plus r theta double dot theta hat, plus r theta dot d theta hat dt. All right, remember we have uh, these dr dt and d theta dt expressions, so we're gonna plug those in. Uh, so this is r double dot r hat plus, okay, dr hat dt is theta dot theta hat. It's theta dot theta hat. And we have r dot theta dot theta hat. Hey, look, it's the same, same piece right here. All right, so that's just going to give us a factor two. Uh, r theta double dot theta hat. And then remember d theta hat dt was minus theta dot r hat. So minus another factor of theta dot r hat. All right. <laughs> Uh, maybe this is easier to read if we group together the r hat pieces and the theta hat pieces. So the r hat is r double dot minus r theta dot squared, r hat. And then the theta hat piece is, uh, we have a factor of two. We have two r dot theta dot plus r theta double dot and those were both theta hat pieces. Okay, we've finally done what we set out to do from the very beginning. That was to find the acceleration in polar coordinates. Whew. Yikes, right? <laughs> okay, so you might say, well, who the heck cares about any of that? Um, well, now we're in a position to actually answer this question. Okay, the gravitational force is radially inward, so... Actually, let's go back to the original question. Okay. Um, so now we're back to the original question. Uh, if, the, if the gravitational force is equal to the net force, is equal to the sum of all the forces, and that's generally true in space. Like as the Earth goes around the sun, the, the main force on the Earth is just that due to the sun. So we can ignore maybe the, uh, the pull of like Jupiter on the Earth. So the net force which is the gravitational force like inward towards the sun, um, is just, is radial, is uh, something in the radial direction, something r hat. And remember, sum of all the forces is mass times acceleration. So what this is saying is that if the gravitational force is the only force on an object, then the acceleration is radially inwards. So in other words, only this piece could be non-zero. This piece has to equal zero. Right? So maybe you're starting to see why this might be useful. Because setting this equal to zero might tell us something that we didn't already know. Okay, so A sub R is non-zero, but A sub theta has to equal zero. So it must equal zero for a, a radially inward force. So if A theta is zero, uh, we can set, so therefore, we can set 2r dot theta dot plus r theta double dot is equal to zero. This is true if, if, you're, if all the forces on an object are just radially inwards or outwards, then this has to be true. Now, I want you to see that this is actually the derivative of something that's equal to zero. So I'm gonna write down r squared uh, theta dot. Okay, so maybe you want to pause the video here and verify that these two things are the same thing. So the derivative of what's inside the square brackets is equal to the top thing. 
Okay, hopefully you paused it and you said, wait a second, that's not, they're not exactly the same, but we need a one over R out here. Now they will be the same. Okay, there was an extra factor of R there. So let's assume we're not, we're, we're moving around, but we're nowhere near the, the origin of our coordinate system. So now we can say that the derivative, now we can just multiply both sides by R. So now it looks like this is zero. Okay. So this tells us, remember that if the derivative of something is zero, then that something is a constant. So R squared theta dot is a constant. And if we multiply by mass, just to, tur to turn this into what's called angular momentum, this is a constant. This is a new constant. It has different dimensions than this thing. So these are different constants. But they're both constant. So we finally proved that the angular momentum is a constant for a radially inward force. Right? So as the Earth goes around the sun, maybe the, the distance to the sun changes. So as r decreases, theta dot increases. So in other words, the, the Earth moves at a higher number of radians per second when it, when it gets closer to the sun. Okay, it's all a consequence of this uh, radially inward force. Okay, so we set out to prove this. So we showed that L equals mr squared theta dot is a constant, right? mr squared theta dot. Now the second piece of this says, show how this proves Kepler's second law. All right, so we can pretty quickly go through that too. Um, okay, uh, Kepler's second law. So remember the first law says that, uh, I just found out the tablet can do that <laughs> to make an ellipse. Um, so remember that uh, Kepler's law says that uh, planets undergo elliptical orbits with the sun at one focus. Um, so maybe the planet is here, and then a short time later, it is here. Okay, they're moving along that ellipse. Right. And if we look at a short enough time, then r is close to being the same value. So maybe r dot is some non-zero value. It looks like r dot is negative here, because r is decreasing. <laughs> so I'd like to look at the area here. All right. So let's see if we can try and keep track of the area. Uh, and actually, maybe I'll make it finite. And then we'll see how we uh, do the limiting procedure to make it uh, infinitesimal. So we have some radius r, and as long as delta a is very, very small, our r is approximately constant, the area will depend on that, that radius and also this arc length, delta s. And that arc length uh, is very close to being r delta theta. Okay, so it depends on what angle we sweep out right there. But r times delta theta is the arc length right there. And the area of a triangle, area of a triangle is one half base times height. Okay, so this this triangle right here. Um, so I have in mind the height is this delta s. Uh, the base is r. Uh, and then a factor of one half. So we have the area of the triangle, or delta A, is one half base times height. This is delta S or R delta theta. Well, let's write it out. So delta A is one half R squared delta theta. Okay, now, um, so now we're going to do a little bit of calculus magic. So we're going to divide by delta t and take the limit as time goes to zero. All right, so we're going to shrink time, the, the, the change in time to be very, very small so that uh, you know the, the delta s will shrink down to zero. It'll be close to zero, but we're, we're still going to keep track of, roughly speaking, how much this changes. Well, not roughly, but <laughs> to first order in the, in the change. Okay, so if we do that, if we Take da, uh, delta A divided by delta T and take the limit as, uh, sorry, delta time goes to zero. Then we get the total derivative. So da dt, the change in area with respect to time, uh, is one half r squared. And then delta theta divided by delta T in the limit delta T goes to zero, that's exactly d theta dt. 
or d, dA dt is one half r squared theta dot. So r squared theta dot, that should look familiar. That's exactly what we said is constant. r squared theta dot is a constant. So right here, one half r squared theta dot is a constant. Again, for the, for it's a radially inward force, which we know from Newton's law of uh, gravitation. So look what we just proved. We just proved that the change in area with respect to time is a constant. So this is the statement that the planets sweep out equal areas in equal times. And if we check the dimensions of this, this looks like an area, right? R squared has dimensions of area. Uh, and then the theta dot is angle per unit time. So that's one over a time. It's area per unit time. So it looks like the, the dimensions check out as well. All right, this is great. We just proved Kepler's second law, and we showed that the angular momentum is a constant. So, so the two are actually tied together. They're, they're, they're basically the same statement. So Kepler's second law is a consequence of conservation of angular momentum. And you'll see other derivations of the fact that the angular momentum is constant, is, sorry, yeah, is constant in this problem uh, when you get to upper division mechanics. Uh, but still, we, we have the tools to, to see that it's true here.